Okay, it is my uh, great privilege uh, to introduce Frank Lee DeLone. Uh, Frank Lee is uh, uh, broadcasting to us live from the, the sunshine state of Florida, um, <laughs> America's foot. Uh, and so Frank Lee worked in my uh, research lab doing organic synthesis for a, a couple summers. Uh, and, and anytime we have undergraduate researchers, we really try to, to push them to, to get smarter than we are. Um, and so, you know, my skill set is very limited uh, to organic synthesis and putting molecules together. And so um, in putting this talk together, you know, I've, I've we kind of pushed frankly, or frankly has pushed really himself to learn more about um, the ostensible goal for why we do what we do, um, which is, you know, thinking about uh, semiconductors and organic materials and how they might actually work and benefit us. Um, and so I really appreciate the way that Frank has sort of taken that uh, challenge on uh, to talk both about some of the, the physics and about some of the, what is pretty hardcore um, organic reactivity type stuff. And so uh, I'll leave it to him and uh, I'm sure we'll answer some questions. Later. Thank you for the introduction, Stefan. All right, let's go. Uh, title, yes. My name is Frankly, that wasn't obvious. Title is Synthesis of Dialkane Intermediates for New Semiconductor Materials. So the important part of this research, like the major driving goal, money. Okay, besides that, electronics. We live in a world, who's that? There we go. All right, we live in a world of electronics. The ubiquity of technology as the decades have gone by, everyone's got their phones, their smartphones, you know their new technology, all of it faster, all of it stronger, all of it a lot more expensive. So now I'm going to explain important aspects of like organic electronics in general and how it, uh, how it matters and pertains to what I'm talking about with my research. But first, let's start from the basics. And when I say basic, I mean basic. Okay, so basics. So you have a wire, right? Nice little gif right there. And you see a wire, wires made of conductive material. Uh, I'll go over what really conductive material means later. But pretty much you have the movement of electrons through your wire and they go from one from the left to the right, it really doesn't matter. You have a current flowing, current being the flow of electrons. And commonly you have a wire, what is it made out of? It's made out of copper. And then it's surrounded by insulating material. Insulating material, like just like rubber, or uh, another example for being like a thermostat. A lot of people have their thermos who want to keep their cold drinks cold and their hot drinks hot. So uh, what is con conductivity? What does it mean to be a conductor? Pretty much it means most metals, for the most part, are conductors. And pretty much that means that they have this overlap with their conduction band being the thing that you see in blue and their valence band, the thing being the thing in red. And it increases in energy and the valence band has this filled with electrons and the conduction band has none. And so they just like share the love because like they're right next to each other. So it's really easy to just share the love. And then semiconductors, they have a bit of a band gap, which is the gap between the valence and the conduction band. And the band gap, it's possible to go over that gap, but it's a lot more difficult than just what you have with a conductive material like a metal where you just go like straight through and you don't worry about anything. You got no worries, no problems. And then you have insulators with a very large relative band gap. And that's just like your rubbers, all your materials that don't normally change temperature very easily. And of course, semiconductors, which is what my research pertains to. And the title of my whole little shebang that I'm doing. So semiconductors, I'm gonna go more in depth into what semiconductors are. So semiconductors, just another photo, just another picture, or you see a small band gap relative to insulators having a very large one and conductors having just literal overlap. And how do they exactly work? What are semiconductors and how do they work? So you have your band gap that's not too big, not too small, sort of like the bears. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. So, and the way, it's very temperature dependent the way it works. <laughs> it's very temperature dependent the way it works. It requires thermal excitation in order for the electrons to jump down, or rather up, whatever. You no, know, depends where you are on Earth. So, electrons jump. They literally, not literally, they kind of jump from the con 
from the valence band to the conduction band as a result of thermal thermal excitation. So like you heat up, you heat up your substance, it takes a little hot. But what does it leave behind? It leaves behind a hole. Is it an actual hole? No, but it's a hole. And so this just fuels the charge carrying electron movement as it goes. And that's why semiconductors are so important. Semiconductors allow for the controlling of current and charge over a distance. And there's a lot of little, a lot of sort of ways that you can use them, a lot of different types of semiconductors, some of which I'll go over soon. So keep in mind the conduction band. And another really important thing to keep in mind that I'll talk about later is a thermal excitation. So you have a difference for semiconductors. You have a different sort of jumping depending on the temperature. It's very dependent on temperature. So semiconductors, what are they commonly made out of? I'm sure everybody's like seen, like seen or heard about Silicon Valley type of stuff. So commonly they're made out of silicon and also germanium. Where are germanium and silicon on the, on the periodic table? They're at the same period. And right above that, carbons, organic semiconductors. I'll get to that later. Okay, so both part of the same periods and they have similar electronic properties, so, which is why they can both be used as semiconducting material. So silicon, also mainly the uh, main component of many semiconductors. And it's one of the most, it's actually one of the most common minerals in the world, like third or fourth most, I think, like 10% of all, of all the stuff in the world is silicon. But, and they're both what's called intrinsic semiconductors. You don't need to add anything to it. They're just naturally semiconductive. And they change depending on temperature, allowing for excitation of electrons jumping over the band gap. But of course, silicon in general, even though there's so much silicon inside of the world, it's commonly found in a silicate form of which that requires a lot of energy to uh, turn into pure silica. So you need a lot of energy because normally it's found in a silicate form, a silicate form because silicon loves to bond to oxygen. That's also where a lot of oxygen is bonded to in the world. It's bonded to the silica that's underneath the Earth's crust that people mine out. So you need to get the silicates, and then the silicates, you have to put in a lot of energy to remove the oxygen. And in order to use them for semiconducting material, it needs to be extremely pure, like 99.99999% pure silicone in order for it to work correctly. And the prop, yeah, whatever. So, uh, so I've talked about a lot how they work and how those electrons. So uh, let's talk more about the types of semiconductors. So type of semiconductors, I already named the first type, intrinsic. That's just pure, just one pure compound by itself, one element, that's it, that's it. By itself, semiconductive. But then you also have something called compound semiconductor, that being um, with additional elements. So it's intrinsic with a little, little extra on the side. This one example being a gallium nitride, which is also a commonly used semiconducting device. Next are extrinsic semiconductors, which are kind of like compound semiconductors, but even more so. And the way that they work is they require a small small concentration of impurities. And by small concentration, I mean like one in 10 to the ninth-ish type of concentration range. You don't need that much. You just need something to start it going. And the reason why you use it is because of dopant. And the reason why the dopant is important is because it makes you no longer have to rely on this thermal excitation in order to have electrons jump. So let's talk about dope, because that's dope. Okay, doping. I'm not talking about that Lance Armstrong type of doping, though it is kind of sort of in the same vein because it increases efficiency. They both increase efficiency. One of them is just legal. Okay, doping, let's go. Doping is a diagram of doping. So there are two different types of dope, two different types of semiconductors for doping. The first of which, like I already said, low, uh, low concentration needed. The first type of which you see on the right here is the p-type. The p-type is you have you have addition of electron poor dopant, which generates holes. So for the example to the left, you see a boron atom, boron being more electron poor than the silicon. So it allows for the generation of holes. And like imagine it's sort of like it gets it gets the wheels started running. That's everything got gets everything starts turning. And then n-type, of course, electron rich is the, the complete opposite. You have phosphorus dopant on the uh, left there. It's the n-type semiconductor, and it supplies the electrons. So what does this mean in a sort of more diagrammy sort of way? So pretty much here, right here. So right there on you, it creates sort of levels, levels that you can sort of shoot out from, and makes it easier to pass by the band gaps. 
So for the first one on the right, the donor levels, that would pretty much coincide with N-type seven, N, uh, N seven conductors, where you're supplying electrons, electron density, which allows for it to jump into the conduction band and starts everything start turning. So another thing that I should mention, if you get conduction bands and valence bands confused, conduction bands, that's where you want the conductivity. That's where you want the electrons to flow to. That's where they want, that's where they want to go, hopefully. And then you got valence bands. You think of like a valence shell filled with electrons, that being the bottom portion that you see there. So again, N-type semiconductors, you, you got the donor level, which makes it easier in that you have like a sort of fresh start on your engine. You get a little, a little couple of electrons go up to the conduction level and start everything starts going. But then there's also P-types. P-types where instead it's kind of the opposite. Instead of having your donor level near your conduction band, you have your acceptor level that's very near your valence band. And you have your, um, you have your holes. It generates holes that the electrons can move to, moves up into the acceptor level. And then from the acceptor level, the newfound acceptor level because of dopant, it has a lot less of a gap that it needs to jump over in order to get to the conduction band. And the reason why it's important is because of efficiency. It allows for less need on thermal conductivity to make it all work. You don't need to worry a bunch, a bunch about temperature. So you don't need to run your things really, really hot because you know you never want your electronics to run really, really hot unless you want to fry your stuff. All right, so next I'm gonna talk about sort of simple sort of junctions. I'm not gonna get into sort of field effect transistor junctions because that gets a lot more complicated. So I'm just gonna talk about simple junctions, which are pretty much combinations of P and N types. And I'm gonna talk about the simplest one. Why is it the simplest one? Because it's only two of them, P and N type, type junction. So you have the N and then you have the P, the P get formating the holes and then the N formating the electron density and you allow for the movement of electrons through it. And this is very important in the creation of transistors and sort of affecting the current inside your circuits. It gets far more complicated than this, but pretty much this is about the way that it works. And another important aspect is pretty much um, you have your electron, when your electrons go from the hole and then another electron goes into the place of the hole that was made because you're having your constantly flowing current. And then sometimes you don't have your current because you know, things happen. But like when you have something filled back up the hole that's left by an electron that already drunk the conduction band, you have a little bit of this linear momentum that gets conserved into thermal energy, which is the reason why you have like a lot of heating up inside your um, inside electronics, something that you always have to watch out for because it's not you know, fry your stuff. Okay, so next, because my talk isn't about semiconductors, it's, it's about a certain subset of semiconductors. What do I mean? Organic semiconductors. What are those? Well, I'll explain. Okay, so organic semiconductors. What exactly does that mean and how does it pertain to semiconductors in general? Organic semiconductors, it's all about the organic. That's the important part. What does organic mean and how does it pertain to semiconductors? It's all about those carbons. Carbons, what do they do? They're made out of carbons. How many bonds do they take? Just like Stefan always says, four of them. So it allows for all these sort of combinations. There are millions, billions of sort of combinations that carbon chains can have. They can bond to so many different types of atoms and elements, and you just have a whole bunch of different compounding electron densities. So that's the, really the important part for semiconductors. It's changing your carbon's electron density. So the benefits of organic electronics. First, they're lightweight in comparison to silicon or like more heavy metals, sort of semiconductors. Because, you know, if you look on the period table, carbon's up here and silicon's right there. So, you know, you got that. Okay. And then next, they're flexible. Why are they flexible? Because they, unlike... Uh, silicone, they don't have this rigid sort of lattice structure that they have to stay into and that you have to carefully put a little tiny bit of dopant in there to make it work nice and good. You can be very flexible in the way that you have your semiconductors. They're also much more cost effective because you don't have to put in all this energy into making your silicone really, really pure. You just have your, just have your carbons. Your carbons are everywhere. You're made out of carbons. Everything you're made out of carbons. Not everything, but like a lot of things. Okay. So... If anyone wants to ask that question, I could talk about the negatives, wink, wink, you know, there are a lot of negatives, but I'm not gonna talk about them because, you know, I'm staying on the positives right here until we get to the negatives. Okay, and then another important thing about them is that they're, 
a little electronic jump there. Okay, so, so, so um, another important thing about organic electronics are that they're dissolvable. They're made, they're from, they're made by organic material, organic, unless you have really long polymers, in which case you have a little vendor wall source and all that. This is slightly less than some of them just like aren't dissolvable at all. But like, you, I'll get later into the types of organic components, but a lot of them are dissolvable. And so because they're dissolvable, you dissolve them and you solve it. Okay, now it's nice and mobile and you can put it wherever you want and do some vac some vacuum uh, vacuum shenanigans to get rid of your solvent and just like straight, it got your organic material right where you want it. All right, so types of organic com uh, components. So big buzzwords type of things. So organic solar cells can also, uh, semiconductors, organic, organic conductors, semiconductors, uh, one way you can use them is as organic solar cells. And pr pretty much absorbs the energy from the sun inside these, uh, inside the molecules and then converts it into energy. Another one is organic field effect transistors. And the easiest way to sort of think about that is, I'm not gonna really get into specifics because it gets really complicated. Stick it like a on off switch, you know, controlling that current, making it all different. And then another way you can use it, you know, OLEDs, you hear about all those nice expensive TVs, the ones that curve. They're all LEDs because they're able to have that sort of flexibility in their structure allowing for you to just have the curves. Okay, so, and then I really like the OLED picture because you see pretty much these really small organic LEDs that are able to fit on just a Coke bottle itself and then they're nice and lit up. It's awesome. And then, you know, maybe one day we'll start worrying someone trying to like that trying to like <laughs> Okay, now let's talk about structural types. So you either have small molecules, like as you see on the left, like anthracene, and then a whole bunch of other ones, really long names, and then you have polymers, which are like repeating units of the same thing over and over. Small molecules are easily dissolvable, and polymers, they're, they're not as easily dissolvable, but they're still easier to work with than the silicon itself, that hard, brittle thing would be. All right, so how exactly do they work? Do they work? An important thing to keep in mind for what you see in all these structures is conjugation. You gotta pass the baton, you know what I'm saying? Okay, so how is that, what is conjugation exactly? So the important thing about conjugation is that it's sort of this repeating pattern of single bonds and double bonds, allowing for this sort of overlapping electron density, this overlapping pi, Pi bondage, a line for the electrons to jump to and fro. And you have your HOMO and your LUMO. HOMO standing for highest occupied molecular orbital. That's where your electron density is. It's similar to a valence band. And then your LUMO, your lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, similar-ish to uh, your, your conduction band. And then you also see that as you can increase your conjugation, you increase the amount of the repeating units of double bonds the single bonds, you have more and more of a difference in the energy gap. It decreases as you get longer and longer, as you have more and more sort of delocalized electron density. And so this back to the original sort of picture that I put up, conduction band, valence band, it's called them homo and lumo. All right, so now we'll talk about band gaps. Just like over here, you saw how it changed in band gaps. They changed because of the conjugation. But like talk a little bit more about why carbon is so special and why you can change them band gaps really nicely. So you see here a whole bunch of different molecules that are possible to create, some of them being really, really just like dirt cheap and different band gaps. So you see different combinations of carbons being uh, aromatic carbons with different um, things bonded to it. And you have nitrogens, you have sulfurs, you have oxygens, and all these change changes the electron density of your molecules. And changing electron densities allows the fine tuning of your uh, of sort of the semiconductors. And trying you're trying to get the smallest band gap that you can, and you're trying to change and trying to tune your sem your uh, molecules so it's a good semiconductor and that it's good for whatever sort of thing you're trying to use it for. Trying to use it for. And so the molecules that you would use for like organic field effect transistor are different than the ones you would use for organic solar cells or for organic field effect. I said that one twice. OLED, okay. 
So pretty much what we based, what we were doing on right here is this paper by uh, Clement in 2010. And he had structures that we thought that we would be able to get to using a different synthetic route. And so we see here, all of them have like this thiophene structure, the thiophene structure being the part in red. It's this uh, five member heterocyclic ring with sulfur attached to it. Why is sulfur important? Well, first off, I just that it smells really bad. Um, sulfur, it changes, it's a very large electronegative atom. It changes the electron density inside your molecule, which is important for fine-tuning fine the structure for whatever purpose that you want it to be for. And so we've chosen sort of this sort of structure that we're going to try to aim for. And I'm going to show you pretty much the route with which that we got, that we, that we tried anyway, to get to that. An important part about the R group there, the R, just, R group being just the part that's R, is like the main goal of research was to be able to have the R group be whatever we want, be able to switch it out with like gallium catalysized reactions and just like mix and match, see how things change. And that's one of the really big, big things about organic semiconductors. It's really easy to change their structures and fine tune them to what you need and what you might require for whatever it is you're doing. So let's go over the retrosynthesis. So we know we want this, but then how exactly do we get this? So the first part, we know we can do this by a reaction called Garrett-Braverman cyclization, which I'll go over later, and pretty much it allows us to get to this synthetic part with um, two alkene groups connected to the sulfur. And then from there, we know that we'll be able to get that from three phenyl two propen uh, thio S, thio, thio, and then uh, propargyl bromide or just any sort of halogen standing for X and R being whatever we want it to be. All the thing in red just being something that we can easily purchase from um, companies like Millipore Sigma or uh, Perkins Elmer and those types of places. So, so we have the thiol and from the thiol, how do we get the thiol? We can get the thiol from um, 3-phenyl-2-propyl-1-EL, the alcohol, and then the thioacetic acid. So let's go over the first reaction really quickly. The first reaction is called Metsonovo reaction. Name re it's a named reaction because uh, Metsonovo made it. Okay, or you discovered it, not really made it, but whatever. So pretty much the main important thing about this reaction is it converts the alcohol into this thioester. And the way that it does this is by um, triphenylphosphine. The main driving force in this reaction really is the triphenylphosphine really, really wants oxygen. So it bonds to the oxygen and then you get your dead, the dead making everything not dead, but better. And dead stand for diethylazetocarboxylate solution because it's only available in solution because you know it's, it's kind of illegal to sell like that pure stuff going through shipping lines. And then you add it with the thioacetic acid that I showed earlier, and then you get your thioacetic, your thioester added onto your 3 phenyl 2 propyl unit. And if you do this reaction, you're done with it, hopefully. How do you know you're done with it? How do you know what you're done with it? You do something called TLC. TLC standing for thin layer chromatography. And it has mainly to do with solubility and um, different chemical structures having different polarities. So you, you have a mobile phase, which is some sort of mixture of hexanes and ethyl acetate. And you change and you fine tune this mixture so that you'll have separate sort of uh, RF values, which I'll go over in a second. And they just like, as time goes on, they go higher and higher. The dotted line standing for the solvent level and the two little blue, blue uh, red dots standing for sort of mixture that you might have inside your reaction vessel. So how exactly does TLC, what do you do TLC for? So you have your, you have a TLC, TLC made, made of silica and then you have your mobile phase. And you just like let the mobile phase through capillary action rise up through the silica plate and everything gets frozen up at different rates because of your mobile phase. And so you have here different RF values, each color designating a different sort of different sort of molecule. So you will dot your first one with just like your unpurified starting material. Your second one with not the first one being unpurified, uh, not starting material, but rather um, product. And then second being one product that you know, and the third one being a different sort of starting material so that you can sort of monitor and know 
where exactly which which um, dots yours and you have different RF values. And now, now that you know which dot that you want to separate, you change and you fine tune your sort of combination of polarity to find a polarity that works well, a mobile phase that works well and gives you good RF values. So with this one on the, the one on the right, you have these good sort of RF values aligned for this great separation so that when you run what I'm going to talk about later called COM, you just have good separations and none of them sort of overlap. So another good re reason to use TLC is that you can see how, how finished your reaction is. You see your starting materials slowly disappear and become products as you do TLCs at different stages in the reaction. And then you have column chromatography, which is kind of like TLC but like upside down. And so you have your organic solvent, this sort of mixture of hexanes and ethyl acetate, which is not the only thing you can use, but one of the most common. And you have your good RF, your good RF values, allowing for great separation. These RF values showing you clearly and quantitatively that you have this separation that when you run this column, you'll be able to run it through and get your get your product without it being mixed up with a whole bunch of different things. But of course, you have to know if your product is what you want. You have to be able to characterize your product. And one of the methods that you use to characterize your product is something called GCMS, gas chromatography, mass spectroscopy. And pretty much really quickly, how it works. First, gas chromatography. It's, you can take your unpure starting material and it separates it by itself. It runs a column of gas really fast. It's hot. And then you have electron ionization, which pretty much sort of splits your molecule into stable, stable sort of ions. And you can get this sort of um, spectrum of ionic densities and molecular masses. So back to the first reaction. You got your alcohol, you got out your thiol ester. You have to pop it into the uh, GCMS. And so what you expect to see in the GCMS is sort of in a mass at around 190. It can be like plus or, plus or minus one a little bit because sort of hydrogens can just split off through, all, through the um, GCMS. And then you also see sort of splitting here at uh, 147, this big portion being 147. So let's see, let's, let's run our GCMS and see if we see those peaks. So this is a GCMS that I ran a while back. And um, you see first a peak at 190, awesome. And you see another peak at 147, awesome. We got what we want. And the part on top is the, um, normally if you had multiple different molecules in there, you would see different sort of retention values because everything, everything gets out based on its molecular uh, sort of characteristics, its polarity, it all gets out at a different retention value. So if this was a compound, which sadly it wasn't, you would get different molecules at different retention times. And then onto the second reaction, being the addition of the propargyl bromide. So we have our diester, and we want to add the propargyl bromide. And we do that with something called sodium thiosulfate pentahydrate and propargyl bromide and potassium hydroxide. And so the, reason, the way this pretty much works is you have your potassium hydroxide. It changes the uh, thioester and gives you just a thiol. And then you add a little bit, like, I don't remember exactly what it was, like probably 0.1 of an equivalence of the sodium thiosulfate pentahydrate to ensure that it doesn't dimerize. Dimerize pretty much meaning that the sulf, that two sulfurs don't just, just like smack together and just bond with each other. We want it to bar, bond with the part of bromide and the sodium thiosulfate pentahydrate just make sure that we don't get this dimer. All right, so we do this reaction and then afterwards, we need to check, we need to do another characterization method. Characterization method that we use being NMR spectroscopy. And I'm not really gonna go in the way NMR works because it's just a really strong magnet and you have spin and that's what I'm going into. I'm gonna show you a spectrum and just sort of explain it. All right. Really strong magnet. So this is an example of one of the spectrums I took. And you also see the importance of purification because all the gunk that's not labeled, that's random crap that should have been purified that I didn't do a good enough job at. So you see here the stuff in red, A, 
um, you have degenerate hydrogens being around the same point and you have different splittings depending on hydrogens that aren't degenerate. And that's an easy enough way to think about it. So at C, you see this pure just singlet peak because C don't bother nobody. It's, there's no hydrogens nearby. And then you also see on D, uh, you see what appears to be a singlet, but actually isn't. You see some sort of hyperfine splitting between the uh, hydrogen at E and the, and the hydrogens at D, which you can see from a Cosney NMR, which is sort of like a NMR on an NMR. It's a 2D NMR. It's really cool. And so, okay, we did the NMR. We know that we got what we got. Definitely needs to be purified more, but we know we got what we got. So next sort of reaction, something that I didn't really, was, wasn't really able to sort of start myself, is something called Gabe Braverman cyclization. So you have, um, you have your propargyl bromides, and the way the Garrett Braverman cyclization works is you sort of have this base. The base allows for sort of this um, rearrangement of the, of the triple bonds to just like two double bonds right next to each other, which is kind of really weird. So it's gonna be really reactive. And so one of the ways that people explain is a sort of bi-radical reaction that just sort of knits everything up and gets you your nice little stuff that you want. And here's something else that's kind of special that you can see in the NMR. So you see at around six-ish, you can see the cyclization occurred kind of sort of by itself. That being the part of six-ish, the small little peaks there. Not really occurring that much because you need something to just like drag it there. That being the, um, the triethyl, actually. And then challenges. The challenges were many and multifaceted. First one being that I hate triphenylphosphine oxide. It's really difficult to remove. And a lot of times I spent hours trying to remove it. That was all gone. Wait a little bit, see some crystals crash on it. Just like, why? It's, it's terrible. I hate it. All right. Another important thing is sort of one of the things we found in the GCMS was sort of this competing side product for the Metanova reaction, which decreases the yield, which is just an important part of it. It makes our yield smaller. And then further work, got to finish the compact. I never got to that. That's, that's up to the future generations out there. Good. I believe in you, Stefan, all, all the future kids, you got, you got them. And then sort of once you make the molecule, test its electrochemical properties with like a CV or like by a substrate and test how it affects the currents and all the band gaps and all that jazz. It's not really anything I'm worried about right now. Okay, so acknowledgements. Thank you so much to Stefan for allowing me to do this ritual from just like giving me a chance to work with him. Thanks a lot to all my chemistry professors for always just getting great ass fucking teachers. And Daniel, fucking rock. Fucking give you all out there. That's it. I'm done. References. Good job. Good job. Whew. I'm happy to open the floor to questions. Questions? Mm. No questions? Awesome. No, that's not going to be how it works. I will walk through the door that you opened. What are the disadvantages to organic semiconductors? Some of the disadvantages for organic semiconductors, one of the major ones being pretty much that they, they are reactive and that they have this sort of shelf life to them that sort of inorganic semiconductors you don't really have a problem for because it's just silicate or germanium or whatever it is. It's not something that needs to be a problem. Also, the, electron, the sort of um, efficiency of electron charge carrying for organic semiconductors is nowhere near that of the inorganic ones, but like over time, it's gotten a lot better. So it just like more research needs to be done to sort of fill in these sort of gaps and make it continuously better, be better and better. We, job, you mentioned you mentioned uh, having like this the space to put like an R group there to like do stuff, right? So like can you, can you talk about what kind of like what we might try to accomplish by doing that, right? Like what kind of things might be we be looking to change as we make these materials? Like in terms of yeah, like like what you what, yeah, like what are you hoping to change when you change like what R is like just real broadly. Maybe you add a lot, like another thiophene group might change the electrical, the sort of um, density of that electronic, the, the words that 
So things that you know through other literatures have worked for other molecules, you want to try that and see how it changes things. Sure. Other questions? Okay, I guess we will thank Frankly. Right. Um, feel free to stay. I will be here for another bit if you want to congratulate Frankly. Otherwise, if you would like to join us for our very last talk for this year, I am sending, a, uh, I will send a link to Michaela's talk, which is going to start here at four o'clock in a different Zoom session. So I will send that link along in just a second, but otherwise, spend your time telling Frankly congratulations, and I will see you hopefully there. I'm going to stop nice. recording. <laughs>